Hello, WKU students. Um, I do not know you guys yet, which makes me sad because there is truly nothing that I love more than a WKU education major. You guys tend to be the more passionate, hardest working, smartest group of people I know. And that's true. That's 100% true. I know a lot of people. Um, and so I don't know you guys yet this semester. I am actually on maternity leave. So I thought, thought it was probably fitting to uh, do my recording with a play kitchen in the background. I was like, yeah, this is fine. They'll, they'll just be fine with it. I could have tried to do something with like a lovely books in the background, but um, it's just as this is what it is. Anyway, I am excited. Um, Dr. Jones has been working so nicely with you guys this semester and teaching you some of the more interesting and important and fundamental topics that you need to know as a teacher, as a regular teacher and a special ed teacher. Um, and I truly hope that you guys have enjoyed the course content. I am coming in as a guest lecture this week because this topic is um, so important. So um, we are going to be talking about diversity in the classroom um, and we're going to be ta touching on disproportionality in special education. And a uh, kind of sad thing is when I was in your place, how many years ago? How old are you guys? Like 20? Okay, so 18 years ago, um, I was sitting in your chair listening to whatever professor was talking to me and they said disproportionality in special education is a huge problem we have to do something about it i remember the professor looked at me and said it's your generation that has to fix this and here i am didn't fix it um still a huge problem and so i'm looking at you guys and saying sadly the same thing i was told almost 20 years ago disproportionality is a huge problem in special education and it is on your generation to fix it. And I hope to heavens that you guys are able to fix it uh, better than my generation was because we obviously didn't do a great job. Um, so let's talk about what, you know, what I'm talking about here. Let's get into it. Can you hear my little dog walking around? There she is. Her tail fell off one time, guys. Oh, that's a story for another time. If you ever have me in class, ask me of how my dog's tail fell off. Okay, back to disproportionality because it actually is very important. Let's. Oops, we're not there yet. I jumped ahead. Um, okay, so this is chapter six of your textbook. Um, so go ahead and make sure that you read that and are up to speed on what we are talking about. And then I'm just gonna pull out some of the more important components. Okay, so one thing that I want you all to know that as teachers in schools, um, more than half of the kids are gonna come from diverse backgrounds. So what do we mean by that? 20% um, speak a language other than English at the home. If you were working here in Bowling Green, in Warren County or Bowling Green City Schools, you know um, there, I'm gonna get this wrong and some of you guys might actually know what there's like over 30 languages represented, um, number of individuals from different countries, different cultures, different backgrounds. Um, Bowling Green's very diverse. 10% um, of the individuals will be actually designated as English, well, um, the, so English, it says English language learners. I have since learned that the correct term or the most up-to-date term is English learners. So you guys can be hip, hip to the lingo. It's not English language learners anymore. It's just English learners. 21% um, live at or below poverty level with an additional 22% near poverty level. And then this is this last bullet point is something that we do not give due diligence to. I certainly don't, and I need to do a better job. 3% of our students are homeless, homeless, right? Don't overlook that. Don't assume that every kid goes home, even if they're going home to a crappy situation. Um, not everybody even has a home to go home to. So make sure that we know that that is happening. Uh, 
diverse students are represented in our schools every single day. Um, unfortunately, we see a differentiation on who is actually graduating, right? So who comes to school and then who leaves school graduating with a degree, okay? So we can break it down by this chart is broken down by um, race and ethnicity. So European Americans tend to be the most successful in school. We can at some point have a discussion as to why you think that might be. And I'll touch on some points uh, as we go on. Um, and by far the least likely group to reach graduation is English learners. So 57% make it to make it all the way through school to the point that they graduate, right? And then um, other individuals are, are kind of in between. So you can look at that that is clearly, it is differential. Um, not everybody achieves high school graduation at the same rate. Um, it goes, uh, okay, so here we go, disproportionality. So, um, there is no reason that there should be more that um, individuals from other races, economic classes, things like that should be represented disproportionately in special education, but it consistently is. And so if you look at this, 73% of individuals receiving special ed services are from diverse backgrounds, right? Um, and we know that, I just showed you guys a statistic, that 51% of the rest of the school population is from diverse backgrounds, but 73% are making up special education, okay? Um, we know that these different groups are overrepresented in categories of intellectual disability, learning disability, and then the shaky, shaky one of emotional behavior disorders. So African Americans are overrepresented, American Indians and Hawaiian Pacific Islander families are overrepresented um, in these categories, and that should not be. And uh, emotional behavior disorders is, is an interesting one that we will get to. Um, sadly, and this needs to change, 52% of students with disabilities graduate with a regular diploma. Another thing that we know, not only are they more likely to receive services in special education, we know that some of these groups, these ones identified here, are actually less likely to be included in general education. So they're, they are then more likely um, to be in more restrictive settings, right? You guys know at this point that all children are entitled to a free appropriate education in their least restrictive environment. All children are, right? And what we find is that some groups of children are actually, we restrict their environment. We don't put them in their least restrictive environment and it, and it is disproportionate based on race and ethnicity and that should not be. So <clears throat> we will now look at the um, idea of poverty and the way and the effects of poverty in a classroom. Um, so reasons why individuals from low poverty areas might struggle academically. So um, one is some of the children, you know, we can start off from birth, right? They are, they are born lower birth weight, their families, their mothers specifically, um, had limited access to health care. They had poor maternal health, in a, inaccurate, inaccurate inadequate, that's a funny word for me to get wrong, um, inadequate maternal nutrition. <coughs> and so starting from when they were even, they're, they're fighting against the stream here, starting from even when they were in utero, right? And then after they're born, we know that individuals in uh, low, po high poverty areas, sorry, have insufficient nutrition, um, and then that can cause them to have difficulties focusing on learning. And then we also know that there can be individuals in high poverty areas are more likely to um, be around household or environmental hazards, um, including toxins that can um, 
be detrimental to their health. Other reasons, um, we know that families at in high poverty situations report consistently that they have increased stress. So they do, are often working multiple jobs, stress associated around limited income and work, transportation, child care. Um, and a lot of this can in, increase the risk of mental health issues for families, parents. Um, and then additionally, individuals in high poverty areas don't really have the same access to some of those enriching educational experiences when they are not in school. So um, I am not sure of the background of those of you who are attending or watching this. Um, I do know that statistics tell me some of you guys are homeless too. Um, and so, and some of you guys probably grew up in high poverty backgrounds. And so you can probably think about, yeah, um, some of this stuff jives, right? I didn't go to karate after school because my mom had to work after school and I had to take care of my brother. And so like, I didn't get to, to take, you know, Spanish after school or any of those, you know, kind of things that some of your other peers might have. So um, things that you need to do to think about meeting the needs of cultural, cultural linguistically diverse students with disabilities. Um, so the first is you need to understand their culture and their background. And so um, take the time, make the stinking effort, learn about the culture, learn about know where on a map your students are from, right? Be able to point on a map that like, I have a student from Oman, that's interesting, it's right here. The neighboring countries are this, this, and this, right? Oh, it's on the ocean, that's interesting. I wonder if they lived, you know, inland or on the ocean. Stuff like that, take the time to learn about, I, it's actually, I'm sure, probably really interesting, some of the um, cultures represented in your classrooms. Um, you know, take time also to learn about how to adapt your teaching based on what you know from it. So don't just assume that everybody coming into your classroom should um, learn the same way. You all hopefully at this point in the in the class know that we are we are going to differentiate and um, be thoughtful and careful about the way that we teach students. And so part of that is we are going to know to adapt our teaching based on their cultural and language backgrounds. Um, another thing is to ensure that each student is involved as an active participant in the, ac in the academic and social community of the school. Okay, I, th I'm, I was not going to do this, um, but I am now. So I'm going to, because this is not really the same. So I don't, but anyway. Um, I came to um, U.S. schools. I was born in England and I came to U.S. schools and I had a very, when I was in second grade, and I had a very heavy British accent and I was very, very embarrassed about it because some kids called me Mary Poppins and made me say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and, it, and I was very, very horribly shy. And so I hated it. And so I literally went for an entire academic year, an entire academic year without saying a word, not one word, not once in school and not one teacher. I sat on the playground by myself and not one teacher ever made an effort to get me involved in the academic and social community of this school. And it probably would have been like, I wanted to have friends. I just didn't really know how. And I was so shy and I was so embarrassed. Um, and so I would take that and think about, you know, individuals who don't speak the language, how difficult it is. All my problem was, was that I sounded a little bit different and that was embarrassing to me. But, you know, if you don't speak the language, if you don't have the access to the resources other students do, it's really hard to kind of break into the culture of a school. So your job as teacher is to not let students sit on the stinking playground by themselves for a year. Do not let, if students are not talking in class, figure out ways to figure out, to help them to know why, right? Put them in learning communities, help them to find friends, all of that. That is your job as teachers and something that I wish people had done for me. Um, so when we, <clears throat> when we talk about disproportionality and all of the reasons, and there's tons and tons, and if you want to know more about this topic, 
send me an email. Email. My name is Christina Noel, um, N O E L. And I, there are so many more readings about this. Um, but one of the main things that people think or that we know is that although we have 51% of students from diverse backgrounds, only 17% of teachers have similar backgrounds as that group represented. In, I'm going to get the statistic wrong, and so that's fine. I should have looked it up, but I didn't. Um, in Kentucky, I'm, I think it's like 97%. Okay, send me an email if I'm wrong, but I think it's like 97% of the workforce, teaching workforces in Kentucky are white and female. And so in, if you are not white and female in school, which we know most people are not, right? More than half of the people are not, then the person leading your class, you are not likely to see yourself represented as a teacher or the person leaving your classroom, okay? Um, and, it's, and we know it's important. There is a lot of resource, research, resources, and data available to us to say that students of diverse backgrounds are more successful when the teacher in their classroom is the same background, okay? So we know that we need to have, well, we know anyway, right? We want diversity in our teaching workforce, um, but we also know that it specifically is linked to student achievement. Um, and I mentioned so briefly, the um, African American and the disproportionality of African American students, especially with the label of emotional behavior disorders. And one of the main reasons that people think this is the case, which, which is basically what I'm saying, is that African American students are more likely to be diagnosed with an emotional behavior disorder than white students. And one of the reasons that people believe this is true is that teachers are white we just talked about that right white female teachers and um we come with like we bring with us what we think is typical behavior right and we bring with us what we think are cultural norms and when individual students do not act the way that we is as like you know white middle class individuals act we think that it's a problem. We call it, we call it a problem. We think this, this person must have a behavior disorder, an emotional behavior disorder. Um, and so I want you all to be very careful of the t what you consider typical and appropriate behavior and be very careful of what cultural norms you are bringing into the classroom and make sure that that is represented within the community that you teach and within the students that you teach. Um, so, this quote here, it kind of sums it up. When a teacher's cultural assumptions lead to the conclusion that a student's social behavior is outside the norm, the teacher make, you know, I'm sure well-intended, God, I hope well-intended, right? I hope nobody is just like signing kids up for uh, special ed services without needing them, but well-intended decisions that undermine the student's educational success. God. Um, so what is culture and why is it important? So culture is all of these things, values, traditions, worldview, common history, geographic location, language, social class, religion, all of that stuff makes up our culture. Everybody has culture, you have culture, I have culture, um, you know, my neighbor has culture, my, our name, you know, our neighbors to the south of us, um, in Tennessee have culture, our neighbors to the south, south of us in Mexico have culture, our neighbors to the south, south, south. Let's blow Mexico. I'm not good at geography. Let's blow Mexico. South Pole. <laughs> Look, I'm horrible at geography. So people in South Pole have culture. Everybody has culture. Fine. Good. Um, and that is often represented in schools. And so what you can, what you'll see is there that schools have cultural norms. There are communication styles, you know, do we expect that everybody raise their hand before they talk? Are people, are students allowed to sing? Are they allowed to dance? Or, you know, are you kind of the teacher that lets people be a little bit more wiggly or do you expect students to sit and quiet, like follow directions and, and quietly 
right what it is that you're supposed to do. There are different ways that uh, you kind of bring your culture of a school that results in different concepts of self, that results in different behavioral expectations that you might have, different management styles, the way that you spend time, the way that you use your space, right? So are you, if you were kind of okay with students being a little bit more interactive, then you might walk around the classroom more. If you expect them to sit and do their work, you might sit at a dip, like at the front of the classroom to monitor. All of those things are what the cultural norms of the school are, okay? Um, and whatever that is, just be aware that some individuals might be left out of that. Right. Um, and so if your cultural norm, the example here is there's an individualist culture um, and that I mean, emphasizes individual achievement that tends to be the culture of it's fair, like a lot of like Western, like definitely in the United States, but maybe not everywhere in the United States. I don't know. So maybe I, I'm, I'm talking out of my depth here. Um, there are people that know a lot more about um, multicultural education than I do. Um, but there are, you know, if we want to break it up this way, individualist cultures and collectivist cultures. Individualist cultures emphasize individual achievement and collectivist cultures emphasize working together for the common good, right? And so if you think about both of those, you can think of different ways that that would result in the way that you teach your class, the way that students in your class behave, um, the different styles, communication, um approaches to learning that they bring with them right okay. all right becoming a culturally responsive teacher <clears throat> so you all i hope please look at me please be culturally responsive teachers please it really truly does not take much um, and is so important to the success of the students in your school so it, this is what you need to do in order to be culturally responsive learn about the cultures and differences right learn about it um, reflect on your own personal beliefs right so so ask yourself those hard questions right um, i going back to this slide here I like I come from an individualist culture I'm super competitive um, and whenever there is a group project I'm just, I'm the person that's like look I'll just do it guys right like I'll just I'll just do it I would rather do it myself than work with other and know that I think that I did it well than work with other people right that is definitely the culture that I come from and that I bring and so I need to reflect on those beliefs. I need to ask myself those hard questions. Like, is that really helpful? Um, and of course, you know that you need to demonstrate care. Um, get to know your students. What funds of knowledge are they bringing with them into the classroom? How can you build upon their, th their fund of knowledge? Uh, to get across to teach the specific skill standard that you're trying to teach use your use the funds of knowledge and the only way you can use the funds of knowledge is if you know what they are 